Hey there, my fellow intellectuals. How are you doing tonight? Kyle here with another video. And tonight we are going to look at solving another problem from the course of theoretical physics by Landau and Lifshitz, specifically the mechanics textbook. So mechanics is the first textbook in this course series. And I did the first problem in the previous video, which was writing down the Lagrangian of a double pendulum. And today I'm going to do the second problem in the book, which is writing down the Lagrangian of a pendulum that has a moving support. So this is the second problem in the book. We're just going to write down the Lagrangian. And effectively, you have this pendulum here where you have this mass M1, which is allowed to move freely along this line here. And then you have this uh, pendulum of mass 2 attached with a massless rigid string or, or rod, whatever. It doesn't really make a difference of length L. And this thing is going to move, this M1, and then the pendulum is going to swing like this while the mass M1 is moving. And so we are going to write down the Lagrangian, and again with the Lagrangian you'll be able to derive what is known as the equations of motion, and you can understand how the motion of M1 and M2 evolve over time. But we're just going to be focused on writing down the Lagrangian, which is defined to be this, this fancy L here. And it is determined to be the difference of kinetic energy T minus potential energy V. And um, we're going to use the following convention, or at least I'm going to choose the following convention in this problem. I'm going to define this upper ceiling here where M1 is allowed to move along this line. Uh, we're going to say that's the zero point. That's going to be where V is equal to zero. That's where the potential energy is equal to zero. We'll also say that Y is equal to zero here to be in line with that that zero point potential energy. We'll call the line, this, this horizontal line here, the, the X axis. And so the M1, the M1 mass is going to have a coordinate of X and zero. So Y is always zero on this line, it never changes. And we're going to define the convention that negative Y points downward. And for M2, we're going to say that it's at a position of x2 and y2, and we'll specify what those things are exactly. Now, one of the first things that we can do in this problem is actually do some trig and work out the sides of this triangle. So this side is going to be L cosine of phi, and then the bottom leg is going to be L sine of phi, just based on trigonometry here, because this is the adjacent side to the angle phi, and this is the opposite side to the angle phi. So we'll have L cosine phi, L sine phi. And now what we need to do is I'm going to write down the Lagrangian in a little bit more of a specific way. So T minus V can be expanded as T1 plus T2 because we have two point masses here. And we can subtract V1 plus V2 because again we have two point masses here. So this represents the kinetic energy of mass 1, the kinetic energy of mass 2, and then the potential energy of mass 1 and 2 respectively. Now, one thing we can do automatically is that we can actually do some simplification here because we can see that mass one is on my potential energy zero point line. It's at V equals zero. And because of that case, we can just set V one to be zero from the, from the get go. And so this is going to be equal to T one plus T two minus V two. Okay. And to be a little bit more specific, we can say, that T1 is equal to 1 half mass 1 V1 squared plus 1 half M2 V2 squared. That's for mass 2. And then we subtract the potential energy of mass 2, which is minus M2 G H2, where H is just the height relative to, to Y equals 0. Okay, so we wrote that out, and now I'm going to just explicitly write out all the different coordinates of mass 1 and, and, and mass 2. So, like I said before, x1 for the first mass is just going to equal x, like I've drawn right up here. And then I will say that y1 is just equal to 0, again in line with what I just drew up there. And then we'll say that x2 is equal to, well, let's think about this, right? mass 2 is here, right? It is offset by L sine phi. 
from mass 1. And because we know mass 1 is at a position x at all times based on our definition, we can say that x2 is always just going to be x plus L sine phi, right? Because x represents the position of mass 1, like we've written over here on the left-hand side. And this L sine phi is this offset between the two at all times. And so because of that, we can write x2 as x plus L sine phi. And then we can say that y2 is equal just to the negative of this, this length right here, because that's below the y-axis. I've defined this to be the negative y-axis right there. And so y2 is going to be negative L cosine phi. Now, why did I want to do this? So why did I want to rewrite all this stuff in terms of x and phi? Well, x and phi are our generalized coordinates. So the generalized coordinates, right, are the coordinates that fully describe the, the positions of all the masses and uh, objects that you know contribute energy into our system, right? So x and phi accurately describe the positions of mass 1 and mass 2, and not only the positions, but their generalized, uh, I guess their generalized velocities are just the derivatives of them, right? So we can also rewrite, we, this Lagrangian can also be a function of not only x and phi, but also a function of x dot and and phi dot as well. And so that's going to be the point of this. We're going to be re rewriting the Lagrangian up here in terms of our generalized coordinates and our generalized uh, velocities, right? And so how are we going to do that? Well, let's take a look at our Lagrangian. Again, we have this uh, 1 half m1 v1 squared plus 1 half uh, m2 v2 squared. So let us go down here a little bit and let's think about this. v1 squared we can think of v1 squared because of its presence right here in the Lagrangian. v1 squared can be thought of as x1 dot squared plus y1 dot squared, which you could write it as v1 x squared plus v1 y squared. You can think of it as sort of this velocity vector v1. This is just, uh, just an arbitrary drawing here, but let's say you have a a velocity vector v1, right, it has a length v1, and it has components v1y and v1x, and hence, uh, due to the Pythagorean theorem, you, could, you can rewrite this, um, you can express the, the square of the magnitude of v1 uh, in terms of v1x and v1y, but v1x and v1y, we just we denote that as x dot and y, or x1 dot and y1 dot, and we square them. Okay, so that's why we do that, and Let's think about this. Well, what is y1 dot actually? y1 is just y equals zero, right? So this, this thing right here goes to zero. So we say bye-bye to that. And this just becomes x dot squared, right? Because we just defined x1 to be x dot squared, or x1 to be just x, sorry. So x1 dot squared is just x dot squared, okay? Just based on on the following relationship um, that we had up here. Okay, so um, what else? What else do we want to do? Um, we want to also do the same thing for the v2 term, right? So v2 squared is equal to x2 dot squared plus y2 dot squared, okay? And what is that? Well, we can say that x2 dot is equal to, if we look at what x2 is, x2 is uh, right here, it's given by x plus L sine phi. That means the first term will just be x dot plus, now we take the derivative of L sine phi. Okay, so L sine phi, what is that derivative? So the derivative will just be L cosine of phi, but remember, you know, phi is a function of time. And so we have to apply the chain rule and multiply it by the derivative of phi with respect to time. So we get phi dot. So that's what x2 dot is. We just took the derivative of this term up here. Because of the chain rule, we, 
we spit out a phi dot, right? And now we have to get y dot, or y2 dot, sorry, y2 dot, which is, again, what is y2? y2 is just negative L cosine phi. And so if we take the derivative of this and we obey the chain rule, we should get in L sine phi phi dot. Again, that's just taking the derivative of this. There's this negative sign out here. Um, effectively, you could have, this, this essentially looks like negative L times the derivative, time derivative of cosine of phi, right? Cosine of phi, the derivative of that is negative sine phi, so it's negative L, uh, negative sine phi, phi dot, and then the, the minus signs are going to give you a plus sign because they cancel each other out, and that's exactly what we have what we have down here. So very good, very good. That's what we have now. We have uh, both all, we have both the x2 dot and the y2 dot. And so if we square them, let's do some squaring. Um, let's go down here, x2 dot squared. That's just x dot plus L cosine phi, uh, phi dot squared. And it should give you this just using normal al algebraic rules. And then plus a two x dot phi dot L cosine phi. And we have y two dot squared is just equal to this. Okay, and now what we can do is we can plug all of this stuff back into the Lagrangian that we wrote all the way back up here, okay? So I'm going to try and just copy this and see if we can bring it down with us and we can see it more clearly again. So let's do this. So here's the Lagrangian. Now let's plug in all these different, all these different coordinates and stuff. So let's do it here. First term is one half m1 v1 squared. v1 squared, we just said, is just x dot squared. And then we have plus one half m2. And then remember, this is essentially just x2 dot squared plus y2 dot squared. So what is that? So x2 dot squared, we can just, we can actually just copy this. We just copy it like this. It's just this term. And maybe we make it a little bit smaller so we can maybe make room. It's not a huge deal. So that's x2 dot squared. And then we have a plus a uh, y2 dot squared, which was this thing. Copy that. Make it a little bit smaller. Add those two things together. And then at the end, we have minus m2gh2. What's h2? Well, h of the second mass, right, is just down here. It's given by negative L cosine phi because we define that to be the negative direction. So we'll have negative L cosine of phi. And what's nice about this expression here is that notice in the middle, we have this L squared cosine squared phi, phi dot squared, and then we also have an L squared sine squared term right here. And so those two are going to combine and that's just going to give us the identity that cosine squared uh, time plus sine squared phi is equal to one. So we'll just be left with the L squared and the phi dot squared at the end of all that. So let's just write down the Lagrangian again. So we've got one half m1 x dot squared plus one half m2. Let's see here. We have, um, what do we have here? Am I forgetting something here? Oh, actually, no, I'm not forgetting anything. I guess we could just combine it at the offset. So notice, 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 notice that we have a one half m1 x dot squared, and there's also a one half m2 x dot squared. So we can combine those two terms and make it look like this, one half m1 plus m2 x dot squared. And then we still have a one half m2 here. And what does it multiply? Well, well like I said, this stuff just gives us L squared phi dot squared in the end because the cosine squared phi and the sine squared phi, that just gives us one. 
And so we'll have L squared phi dot squared plus the stuff in the middle. That's 2 L x dot phi dot cosine of phi. And then this term here becomes a, uh, a positive term because of the two minus signs. So we'll have M2G L cosine of phi. And that, everybody, is the Lagrangian of our system. So there you go. That wasn't as long as the double pendulum problem, but I hope it was still as informative and it helped you uh, see the process of how I go about deriving the Lagrangian for this problem. And with that, I will be concluding the video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I had a lot of fun doing this and stay tuned for more videos like this in the future. And I hope you have a wonderful night. Take it easy, everyone.